Hi, I'm Joseph Craig with Scientific American Book Club, and I'm here today with Carl Schoonover, author of Portraits of the Mind. Hi, Carl. I've heard that you have carried pictures of the brain in your wallet, and that was actually related to the birth of this book. I so, used to, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I used to, um, in that little part where you put your kids' pictures, have various images of the brain, microscopic images, sort of whole images, and, uh, you know, I would just show them off to anybody who would give me the time of day. And um, I always had a great interest in, in the visual imagery of the brain. At the time, uh, I was and still am a graduate student in the lab. And, uh, you know, in addition to doing research, I just was very interested in what's going on around the field that I happen to be in and the, the beautiful imagery that you can encounter um, all across neuroscience, really. And so I collected, and some of those images were small enough they could, they could fit in my wallet. And you read into your soon-to-be editor, and yeah. So then we we met by accident, and um, she saw some of these pictures, loved them. We started talking, and the next thing, this, the next thing we knew, we were you know making a book out of this thing. I was just starting out in graduate school at the time, and so and, and this book really for me was an opportunity to get to know the field a little bit. With the images in the book, uh, you start off with the ancients, uh, with Galen. Mm -hmm. To explain, uh, you know, why his ideas about the brain had such a long-standing influence. And yeah, so it's it's a very interesting history because this is a man who now we're talking second century Rome, who um, dissected animals and described, didn't draw, but described his dissections of animals in writing, and those teachings formed the basis of close to fifteen hundred years of dogma, good and bad. Um, and, you know, of course, over all these years, it evolved a little bit. But what's, what's interesting is how stable some of his ideas were for so long, including the ones that were just completely wrong. The general idea is that he, um, his, his writings were sort of passed along from one culture to the next, first in the West, then uh, in the Middle East, massaged, added to, um, and, and over centuries sort of formed this basic picture of the brain and how the mind relates to it. And fundamentally what this meant was um, the ventricles inside of the brain, which are these large kind of cavities, which we now know are filled with salty water, were believed to be the seat of various mind functions, cognitive functions, emotional functions, and so forth, sensory functions. And the reason they were believed to be so uh, is because they th uh, it, was, it was thought that they were full of gas, right? And gases were uh, the way that bodies worked, right, in, in this sort of early vision of the human body, early vision of the human mind. Um, and so for 1,500 years, and this is not Galen's fault only, but the, also the church fathers in the 4th and 5th centuries who sort of co codified all of this. Uh, but in his view, basically, the brain itself, brain matter, was more or less irrelevant. The action was really inside these cavities inside of the brain. So once we got past Galen and mm -hmm. you had Golgi with his, uh, you know, his new method of staining, mm -hmm. it was really I guess you would say Santiago Ramon y Cajal mm -hmm. who kind of ushered in modern neuroscience. Absolutely. So, you know, if you take a brain out of a skull, okay, and you cut a thin slice of it and you put it under a microscope, you're not going to see anything. It's going to be gray. You might see a few shades, but you're not going to see the structure inside nervous tissue because it's just, it, there, there's nothing there unless you do something to it. So you need to stain it somehow. You need to reveal the structure in it using chemical stains, or now we use sort of molecular biology and genetics to do this. But one way or another, the, the, the brain slab alone is not going to tell you anything. And so Camillo Golgi came up with this method of staining neurons, which was incredibly fruitful, because what it does is it essentially colors in or darkens individual neurons in the tissue, but only a very low number of them, about 1%, and leaves the other ones completely unmarked which means that you can actually look at their fine structure without being distracted by all the other ones around them. And as you said, Ramon y Cajal then sort of took the stain and made some seminal discoveries, some seminal observations based on his stainings of, of nervous tissue using Golgi's uh, method. I mean, the, uh, the staining techniques have obviously advanced quite a bit, and there's some really interesting ones now. Could you tell us a little bit about what a brain bow is? Ah, the brain bow. Well, that's, that's uh, the invention of uh, uh, a number of people up in uh, Cambridge uh, at Harvard University, uh, especially Jean Levay, who was a postdoctoral fellow a few years ago. If you just stain neurons the same color, 
because they're so dense and because they're so large and convoluted and sort of wrap into each other, it's really hard to tell them apart. And if you're in the business of trying to understand how everyone is con connected, if you can't differentiate one neuron from another neuron, then you don't know how they sort of all fit together. It's all just sort of one big dark mass. And so the idea behind the brain bow is to paint neighboring neurons different colors so that they can be distinguished one from another. And based on being able to, be, to distinguish them, one can then sort of piece together how they are all connected to each other. One, uh, one other approach to studying the brain is, is looking at blood vessels mm -hmm. and blood flow. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about how that contributes? Yeah. So there's this very interesting relationship, which is not at all worked out yet, between neural activity, which is electrical in nature, and blood flow. And at its base, it's kind of a simple idea. Neurons, when they're more active, uh, and therefore when they're more electrically active, I guess you could say, require more energy. They require more oxygen. They require more nutrients. And so the brain has evolved so that the local volume of oxygenated blood can be increased when it's needed in certain places, which turns out to be very useful because that is one way that um, one can image the brain in the live human subject without actually sort of sticking an electrode down into the brain and trying to record the electrical activity. In your book, you, you, know, you emphasize that it's important to be scientifically rigorous about especially fMRI. Could you explain what some of the abuses of uh, that would be? I want to point out that, that brain imaging fMRI is miraculous in a sense, right? Because it allows us to map neural activity in a live human patient who can, when it's done, walk out completely unharmed. And it's, it's really opened up a lot of doors. But that said, it's imperfect. It's imperfect because we don't want to be sticking electrode in, el electrodes into people's brains. We don't want to make holes in their skulls and so forth. Um, and so its imperfection in part stems from the fact that you know, changes in blood flow occur on the level of seconds, right? Whereas changes in neural activity can occur on the level of milliseconds. And so you're using a proxy, you're using a readout of neural activity that's actually quite far away in terms of speed and also in terms of size um, from what's actually going on in the brain. So it's kind of an indirect reading of what's going on. So what did you find most personally exciting about the project? Well, for me, this book was a little bit of an experiment. Uh, and the experiment was, is it possible to write a book about techniques and still somehow make it exciting to someone who doesn't have skin in the game, so to speak? And I find them actually beautiful to think about in their own right. Um, sort of the analogy I like to make is to, to mathematics, where um, sometimes certain proofs are, are great not only because of what they've shown, but also because of the way they've gotten there. One talks about elegant proofs. And, and I, I'd like to argue in this book that there's a lot of elegant technique in neuroscience as well. Did you find that labs were excited to share these images with him? Yeah, yeah, this is, this is a great adventure for me, and I think very um, illustrative of the scientific community in general, which is this is a community that wants to share, that wants to disseminate information, um, that wants to also show what it can do. And, and labs around the world were very generous uh, with their contributions. You know, I mean, the large majority of the people involved in this project I've never met. I've only sort of written an email and, and you know, sort of explained what I was trying to do. And they said, oh, yeah, we got, we got a couple images you can have a look at. And, and uh, we're just very, very generous, uh, and not only with sort of sharing their work, but also afterwards, once I've written captions, especially for areas that were not my area of specialty, reading them over, making sure that everything was sort of accurately described, and, and sort of you know, giving, giving the story a fair shake. I'm Carl Schoonover, author of Portraits of the Mind. You can find my book at Scientific American Book Club.